burning. You, there's no pigmentation. You you were saying you were concerned. Yeah. So the concern I have is if you show the moving curve, nobody's gonna know what that means. No. And so I think yeah, um, if we could just take that same elevator pitch that worked with me and put it put it together along with the curve. Um, at least we've got a chance of people forgetting what, what it is that we're trying to talk about. Um, uh, and I think just using monopolies enough. The, the thing is that um, okay. I think you've met these gentlemen before, yes, Kimberly. I'm just gonna take this. Thanks. The um, variety has to be attenuated. And that which isn't concrete and such has to be made. Up. At the present time, the curve is the only thing. The causal is something else, it's part of it. So, at, at some time in the future, it has the possibility of be, becoming a, ma a major trademark. I think it becomes extremely important to discipline ourselves to get away from words and stick to um, the, these Im uh, material images. So, in dealing with the with a science fiction writer, we show them your your person with the thing on their forehead, and and we give the analogy of the, of the iron filing or the, or uh, flatland, and what we want in the story, where in essence, um, in a causal land, uh, where they the, the they really have only one religious major religious symbol. That symbol represents uh, the golden rule. And so in having this, this conversation with this science fiction writer sitting across the table, we, we can't have him going all over the place, or her. Uh, it, despite the fact that they may not understand it, I think it's the anchor point. It, it, it's our counterpart to the cross, the Star of David, uh, whatever the other religious symbols are. So, uh, I think it becomes extremely important how in the world we can... Uh, hi, Beth. Hello, hello. Uh, 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 it becomes extremely important of how we control our own behavior. And so here we are, a couple of... S several people who've escaped from the... Thank you. Who have escaped, and we come back with us on our forehead. So, despite the fact that it may not be understandable, I think it's important to, to have something concrete and physical and that attenuates variety that controls our behavior, and we focus when we're talking to the science fiction writer. That the central theme of everything we're doing. Is that symbolization again coming back to why I think these dialogues and the conclusions I've come to and such I just want to share with them what you do is, is up to yourself uh, what my recommendation if if today I was sitting across from a science fiction writer I would use the uh, picture that you created and, and and say this is what I want this is what I have in mind is that in essence that uh, these people have escaped they've gone to a causal land here's the nature of a causal land they've come back to causal land and they're faced with a problem Guys, need a few more minutes to look at the menu? Yeah, just, just take a moment.
Is it one egg Benedict or two eggs Benedict? It's one egg. Um, I'll give you mine. Uh, I'll have the large soup. Yeah. I'll have the uh, two eggs Benedict, not on anything, but with the sauce. And, and uh, some, uh, some smoked salmon cream cheese with it. Uh, a, um, my, a small salad, I'm going to chop my salad. Neat name. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so two eggs Benedict by itself with uh, some smoked salmon and, and your salad. And the cheese. And cheese? Cream cheese. Cream cheese, yeah? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Put that away for you. What can I get you? I'll take the soup with the salmon and the eggs. I'll skip the salad. Soup and the salmon? Yeah. And right. the eggs and as well? Eggs. So half and half? And no, no salad. Okay. I'll have uh, two eggs poached. Two poached eggs, yeah. And um, whole wheat bread, coffee. Like some soup, David? Uh, what's the soup? It's a tomato soup. I'll pass. What kind of coffee would you like, decaf or regular? A regular coffee is fine, yeah. And how would you like that, black with cream or milk? Uh, with milk and sugar. Okay. All right. Hey, thanks Could, I, no could I also get a coffee with cream, please? Yeah. So if I talk to an author and I, I tell them why, like, why does this symbol, what did, what did they see that they're coming back with this symbol? Well, the, the sim would you, would, one would, ha you would likely have to then ta start talking to them about Monopoly yeah. and, and uh, uh, coin tossing. Because in essence, if you, if you have 100,000 people tossing coins, you have a toad board, at the first signal, you, you, you have 100,000 coins going up in the air, heads wins, 50,000 people win, and 50,000 lose. And you give them a single gain, and it continues. Uh, 25,000 and 25,000. Before you know it, you've got one winner who, who's thrown heads 10 times in a row. It's, it's this type of thing. That's the smartest person in the room, right? Well, he then gives advice on heads, how to throw heads. So, um, the, the, the there's this other aspect. Um, there, there, there are two things here. One has to do with lawfulness and the possible application to our behavior of inequality. And the other has to do with the general characteristics of any major breakthrough in our knowledge of human behavior that is comparable to uh, relatively in quantum physics. And what are those characteristics? And so the fiction, I think, can embody both. But if we're going to keep that science fiction writer focused, and not by what we're saying to him getting confused. Because certainly I come at this thing one way, one day, another way, another day, how the mood strikes me. Um, I, I think we need an anchor point. And I'm suggesting strongly that that anchor point be, be the dynamic uh, curve. Mm -hmm. That's a tattoo. We, we, could, we could, wearing our commercial hat, we can say, here, here's what's happening in the tattoo industry. There's leaving our altruism to one side. The, the, the chances are, with the next period of time, that there's a reasonable chance that there'll be dynamic tattoos. So if in turn, you, we create a story involving... Me, Mr. Brown. Thank you. If we create a story involving dynamic tattoos, 
and, and in turn, so that commercially, did you want uh, com commercially? Uh, we'd have a movie, and in turn, one of the commercial products coming out of this would be the tattoos. And uh, aside from the message, "May the force be with you," um, that's been inherent in the movie. Mm -hmm. But I, I think there's something in there is that um, I think a lot of science fiction authors, in particular, like to predict the future. Yes. And so, if you can show that there's something that's coming just around the corner that which they haven't seen yet, yes, they, they might appreciate that. So, I, I think that the where would we be today in electromagnetism, electricity, if iron filings didn't exist? I don't think we'd have the modern world. It's the iron filings that enabled the force field to be visualized. And uh, the, uh, it's, it's very interesting reading Faraday's history and then the mathematization of that by, by Maxwell. So, we don't have a way. Excuse me? Would you like me to bring that coffee for you right now? Oh, it doesn't matter. What's, what's the meals? Okay. Thanks. So I, I think in, in disciplining ourselves, if we were sitting around this table with this on our head, that would focus our attention. We won't go off here, we won't go off there. We'll we can continue. all become good Samaritans. Well, we'll be faced with what do we do? How do we answer to people when they say, what's that? And why are you wearing it? Well, the I think perhaps the easiest way is is let them read the fiction associated with it. Because the fiction, the fiction doesn't have the curtailment of reality. It permits thought experiments and to create an environment where they can experience the trauma that people are having, uh, what, what it's like in the causal land. Not unlike what happened with, with Flatland and, and the purpose it it's shown, it, it served for Tom Banchoff, who's trying to teach students about the fourth dimension. If they say, what do we want to accomplish? Uh, what, what, what precedent do we have? Uh, we refer him to Tom Banchoff uh, and, and his use of Flatland and what he had to say. I'm, David, there's a a single sheet in there in the magazine that this one no this one okay would, would you just read that aloud this a yes, quotation yes. from something? Yes, a, 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 book, a quotation from Tom Banchoff's website, one of them. So, quote, the Flatland raises the fundamental question, how do you react when you come face to face with the truly transcendental, with something which recognize almost from the very start that you will not be able to comprehend fully? How do you recognize, or how do you organize, your insights, and how do you communicate them to other people? It is that question that brings together the evangelist, the artist, and the student of higher dimensional mathematics. The Flatland analogy provides one of the best ways to approach the challenge. This looks like it's from Hypergraphics Exhibition. Woods Jerry Gallery, Rhode Island School of Design, October 4th to 15th, 1984. A symposium at uh, Brown University, October 11th to 13th, page 1984, page 4 of the exhibit program. And that's a quotation from Tom Banshoff? Yes. How does he spell his name? B-A-N-C-H-O-F-F. -F. And his yes. claim to fame was what? Well, he, he's... Uh, a, a long, quite famous in, in his own way, but uh, quite successful professor teaching physics in fourth dimension 
at Brown University. So, in essence, that's our problem. And where uh, Abbott fell short, because the, is, since we're dealing with human behavior, is Abbott didn't go into what, if, if the square had to live by what he found in square, in, in sphere land, but in flat land, how would he exist? How could he control his own behavior? And how could he possibly con communicate to others? Mm -hmm. And so we do not have a counterpart in social science of flatland. And that's our goal, is to create that counterpart. So it brings to the, the surface the problem of the nature, the character of the nature and the consequences of a breakthrough in social science. You wouldn't say that Plato's Cave is a, is a comparable story to Flatland in for oh, social science? Um, yes, I wouldn't. It's, it's just that um, it, doesn't, it doesn't go far enough. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, Banchoff's work and his uh, obsession with it and everything that he's done would make it easier for us to communicate uh, to the science fiction writer because I don't think that but even with Plato's Cave look at how many years that's in existence to warn us but here we have a specific instance if you have a find any lawfulness comparable to the lawfulness found in physics in in, in social science, what's going to be the characteristic and the consequences? And we're dealing with that actually in the curve, in the, in, in the um, wave. I think that's, that's a, a flaw I see with Plato's cave. It's not an active life thing. So when you look at the prisoners, their, their state is, is, you can feel very detached from it because they're not living life, they're just stuck in a, in a jail cell. So. Um, whereas with the flatland story, it, it, it does not feel like they're in a... It goes a step so. further, I think. Mm -hmm. There's great similarity between the two, but... The and we have the advantage in terms of communicating to, to the science fiction writer. Uh, we, we have the advantage of Tom Banshaw faced with the problem, how does he teach students about the fourth dimension? Mm -hmm. When it's just not available to our senses. So, by bringing this problem to the surface by the analogy between the second and third dimension, can enable the students to sense what the problem is. And, you know, we have a whole social science community looking for solutions, and yet we don't have anything comparable to this in the literature. So, even if we do nothing more than create a parable that serves a, a function somewhat similar to uh, Flatland, we will be making a contribution. Now the problem of course comes back, once we have some consensus among ourselves, it is a shovel money problem. You have to run a business, and you can't afford to be distracted by this type of thing. So, I don't know what we do. Um, if, if I was in my current financial position and in good health and younger, I would just proceed with this thing. And, um, get whatever help I can in taking this to the point where meaningful discussions can be had with uh, appropriate science, uh, science fiction people mm -hmm. and to get, get the feedback and then um, the, ra the raising of the shovel money will, will always be back in my head yeah, because we can get the senior money but who's going to, this thing you have to go to bed with it on your mind, get up with it on your mind, it's, it's all consuming. And uh, Like Beretta, 
different scale. <laughs> if we ask ourselves, and I think we should have, what, why is this? Why is this important aside from my obsession? For for me, it's important because on on several levels. Um, not necessarily in order of importance. This is the first time in history that man has the power to destroy man completely. And if you look at the bulletin of the atomic scientists and you see the minutes to midnight, and it's frightening. And if you've had my experience in the marketplace, you recognize nobody's in control. No matter what they say the market goes up, goes down, does this, does this. they don't know what they're talking about. They, um, so, one, if we're going to survive, we've got to find a breakthrough. Or else we're going to obliterate, obliterate ourselves. If we're going to survive, we have to find ways where we're literally automatically live by the golden rule. Because failure to live by the golden rule is contributive to the probability of our destroying ourselves. If we have to find a breakthrough, what are the characteristics, what, what are the barriers, and what are the dangers? These are worthwhile questions. The other question is, does it, uh, could a breakthrough exist, but because of these characteristics not be recognized, for what it is. I suggest that this whole area of starting with the mauve and the normal curve represents that. And all these things in one way or the other are given credit by people like um, the Taming of Chance and such. Uh, practically everything we're talking about is in the literature today except what we're talking about here. So this is important if man is going to survive. It's important for our kids to recognize their inequality. It's important to recognize their face with a paradox. And that because that paradox is unlivable, to, to not look at a solution is self-defeating. The fact that it looks impossible, it doesn't matter. From this standpoint, it, it looks like any hope of changing behavior would be, never be as fast enough and to improve. But it's important what we're, what we're trying to do. And it's important that the thoughts be put out there, criticized, evaluated. And it's important that they feel it. It's important that it be done in such a way that it's just not summarily dismissed. And if it's done as edutainment, um, people can take it with a grain of salt and some people can take it seriously. So I think it's extremely important, if, you know, as a grandfather and an uncle and a human being, is that it's my obligation to say, look, here's this is why it's important, here's the dangers, here's the characteristics, here's the level of, I've reached in my thinking. Uh, it's not adequate. And uh, I, I think what, what we're preaching here will come to surface whether we do something or not. If, if it's in my mind, it's in, it, it's in uh, somebody's mind among six billion. So, um, like the article on the ethical implications of the polo distribution. Well, it's got nowhere because he did, he did it in writing. And the he ethical implications of which distribution? Uh, polo. Uh, he he, polo. he yeah. created that name because he's yeah. saying it doesn't matter what the distribution is. The, mm -hmm. the ethical implications, this is what we're talking about. And then he's questioning whether it's lawful. But th that, that's another question. But there is the, an implication that if... There is an implication that if you encounter something that's important for mankind, take a shot. Isn't it the right thing to do? Isn't that the right thing under the golden rule? Burke, where do you think this problem ranks with the other major problems in the world today? The nuclear problem, the terrorism problem, 
Uh, would you say that it it ranks with any of these equal ranking, more important? Thank you. I'll be right back with your coffee. You catch it if you have. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, nothing is as intertwined with the terrorism problem than this than this question. Nothing is as intertwined with the terrorism problem as this question of the golden rule. Yeah, the the interrelated. Yes, sure. Maybe the well, cause. You maybe, know, you the, take global. The, the wave is the cause of the terrorism problem. Well, because behind the terror is a financial problem. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the financial problem, I think terror goes away. My opinion. It's a rhetorical question because I. Well, I, you know, when I think of the other problems that seem to be so insurmountable, I've asked myself, how would it rank? It's all, for me, it, it, it almost like there, there are some problems that are even more immediate. So I don't know the answer to this question, Frank. But in essence, if we have a wrong philosophy of what contributes to inequality, then our actions politically and economically are wrong. And our actions are what? It, our actions, if our basic model is an error, then our solutions to the problems of economic inequality, politically and economically, are wrong, will be wrong. So, um, so and this is an everyday problem in wh whatever is happening in the running of governments and making our own decisions. So the whole idea that we're like iron filings in a in a, a force field is very unappealing, but the evidence seems to be there that that's the case. So you people say, well, then it's impossible. Well, so is flying impossible and going to the moon and going mm -hmm. on the other planet. You live within the, the confines of what gravity permits us to do and doesn't permit us to do. So. Uh, it's funny. Um, there's a there's, an, there's a candidate running for presidential office out of Silicon Valley. I don't know if you're familiar with the name Laura, Lawrence Lisig. Lawrence Lisig. Um, so he's he's running on a platform that if he's elected, he will reform uh, campaign financing and then resign <laughs> on the next day. And so he's saying that's all I want to do is just do that. Uh, he's he's a lawyer from Harvard. Right? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Then you come back if you can get some yeah. strawberry or raspberry jam. <laughs> that's he's, interesting. He's <laughs> taking a very interesting approach to financing the campaign. He's, he's doing he's crowdfunding his shovel money for the campaign. Mm. So the, the initial few million dollars are coming from that. The funny the thing I find funny is that when you when I see. Uh, Political, political donations being an issue for democracy, it's it's completely to do with the, the wave. And yes. stopping that kind of idea of like, basically what, what more, more, most people see as corruption. Yes. Um, is, is essentially, it's, it's essentially stopping the wave. We took this visualization, Burke, and we put it in front of. Um, we sent it to say the, the top twenty um, science fiction authors in the world today. Do you think something would result from that? We find out if it works <laughs> or not. We'll get feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I, I frankly I don't know the right way because I just don't have the experience of dealing with that community. Is is there um 
I mean, where do these guys generally go for their ideas? What in, what it motivates a, an author to pull, pull in an idea into the story? Again, I don't have the answer. Charles, there's an interesting way to look at this as a deal. Yeah. It's a ten-year deal. Uh, because from the initial publication of a book to the release of a blockbuster movie is often five to ten years. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an interesting property. It's maybe even called a franchise, all right? You know, they got the Superman franchise, they got the Batman franchise, they got the Iron Man franchise. This is, this deal could be looked upon at that scale. Mm -hmm. Billions of dollars can be made on this deal. And this is something, of course, I've learned from Burke, that you look at a problem, look at an issue, look at a technology, look at an invention, turn it into a deal. If it's a deal, there's a methodology to be employed. Initially you have the shovel money problem, of course, to get the thing started. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned from Burke over the years is you look for deep pockets. You, you, you go with a, try and find a partner that's got enough money to fight off all of the competition and the lawsuits. So here's a 10-year deal. Um, Yes, there's a communication problem, um, but there might be the right, there might be one person somewhere in the world with the money and with the level of interest and the motivation to stick with this thing for 10 years. Mm -hmm. and it's a younger guy than Burke. Much younger. He's maybe, more, uh, obviously somewhere. younger than me, maybe closer to your age. So, if that's a deal, if there's a deal around this thing, then you put together the answer to the six house, seven house, and the one who. You've heard that one already, right? That's one page. And it says uh, how much money can be made, how it, how can it be made, how free will I be from management, and these are answers to the, be the deep pockets person. Mm -hmm. Not an elevator pitch, except it, it's close to an elevator pitch for somebody who's used to investing, because that's what they want to know. And everything else is a detail. The, the science fiction writer pitching to the science fiction writer, getting him on board, getting them on board, could be a, could be a team of science fiction writers. Mm -hmm. The goal of which is that 10 year launching that franchise. It's science fiction, but it can change, could potentially, change the world if we don't blow ourselves up before them. So that's that's simple business perspective for me, which puts everything else in its place. Uh, the meetings with science fiction writers, the dis all these discussions, that they're all aimed at the ultimate purpose, but they are clouding the deal. <laughs> all these little things cloud the deal. So who do you, who who's the target? Who who could we get to? Could we get to that deep pockets person without the science fiction story? I don't know. Never been here before. <laughs> this is a big deal. This is the largest deal Burke has ever come up with in his entire career. It's world changing. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, a, that's for, sort of a nice thought, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> There's one group that I've seen that can do it because they've just done it. In September, they they released the have done it. They've done it. They they released the hieroglyph hieroglyphic uh, package. The year before, they were doing um, uh, the, the name of the competition. Uh, it was a crowdsourced competition. I don't know the hieroglyphic package. What is it? Hieroglyphic. So they did a. Thank you. No, I don't want the bagel. You don't want the bagel. 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 I'll take the bagel. Okay. Charles, you want half? You got a bagel. I got a bagel. The, is this work? Yeah. It's an anthology of short stories. Thank you. Um, That's great. Which is imagining the future. Uh, mm. So Corey Docker has got an entry in there. Oh. Uh, Carl Short has got. But these guys are in Arizona. Well, uh, isn't that what came out of the meeting with the friends of the Merrill Collection to use an anthology, right? That yes. That was one of their suggestions. So they they went ahead and I know there's at least four of the authors in that anthology who are Canadian. Like That's literally Toronto-based. 
Uh, and that was recently issued, recently this, published? This was published in September uh, of that's, last year. That's neat. Um, they've that's given, quite relevant. It is. Yeah, they, they've given us some advice uh, earlier on with the competition, um, the Taming of Chance competition. My question is, would it be worthwhile to talk to them again? Uh, with Now that we've got the final results of that competition, um, at least, I mean, not final results, but... Talk the, to them with what goal in mind? them taking this on as a new project. I think that's quite relevant, Charles. Sure. Figure out how to how to get a message, how to get to them, what to, what to say to them, mm -hmm. how to get their interest. Work, what are you looking for? No, it's okay. Okay? No. So if we had something that could communicate to them who are basically a hub for different uh, science fiction authors, but my question to them, I, I okay, think we'd start with, how exactly are they monetizing, or what is the business around the anthology that they've already done? In the they're, in, they're not the source of funds, right? Right. Okay. So anybody well, they're, who's there, I think they're the source of the shovel money. Like they're they're because they have full time professors employed there at the uh, CSI, the Center yep. for Science and Imagination. They can That's afford to take on risks without, you know, it's not like in a publishing company mm -hmm. where. You'd be expected <laughs> uh, to deliver something this quarter. Uh, yeah, they spent quite a bit of time on that. Well, product. if they're a source of capital, that that's the first rule, I think. That mm. Do you? I think you get lost in a black hole if you're just talking to the idea people who don't have money. Mm -hmm. You have to go. You have to go to the source of either the big money or the shovel money, probably the shovel money first, because otherwise you can't, you can't, you can't move forward, mm -hmm. right? No shovel money, you go broke, you mortgage things, you know, you, I, I think you're certainly on the right track when you're talking about that, a group like that. Where are they based? Arizona. Are they based in an academic institution? Yeah, ASU, uh, Arizona State University. So that provides shovel money in terms of manpower, if the interest is there. Who's based there? Uh, the Center for Science and the Imagination. The ones, so they organized a um, short story anthology uh, where they commissioned several science fiction authors. Um, and uh, artists to put it together. It's very, very well produced. Uh, In what format? A uh, book, printed book. No multimedia yet. Nothing. Nothing else. I don't else think they pursued that. No. So, but prior to the um, prior to the release or the d development, they had a kind of a, a web private presence that they maintained um, with a forum, and they attracted through that forum a number of people who were literally discussing the ideas that ended up making their way into the, into the book. Um, so that that I found very interesting as well. Yeah, sure. In terms of and the book, of course, is the basis of a movie, right? Mm -hmm. So That's then, the, the way the movie industry still works, the question would go to what what would be the um, the terms uh, that they can work with, either in the crowdsourcing uh, kind of structure or where they shop this idea around to different uh, yeah. authors. I prefer the latter, to be honest. Yes. Because there's enough authors. It's a it's the kind of industry where there's a lot of people, uh, and the people who are doing it seriously. Are probably the ones you want to be speaking to first. Yeah, sure. Well, it, it, taking an analogy, when I dealt with the the library, the question was basically, does the story I have in mind actually exist? And that's how we had the meeting. Mm -hmm. It didn't certainly didn't seem to be in existence. Doesn't, doesn't seem, to, seem to be what? Doesn't seem to be in existence. You know, is this, is there a story already? Yeah. Uh -huh. It didn't turn out, it, we didn't turn anything up. No. So if the answer is no, the next question is why, why should it exist? Because it's a multi-billion dollar deal. Brooke always taught me you want to get somebody's attention especially someone who's running a corporation mm -hmm. 
we talk to them about making money. Earnings per share, if they're a public company, or bottom line profit. You see, uh, since if, if you take the organization's sides and the imagination and their goals, what we want to do fits in with their, their goals. So going to them and trying to explain to them what we're trying to do and ask them how can you help us mm -hmm. would be the type of thing you would do if you have shovel money. You would seek the advice you need. Um, so if I'm selling this to somebody who would be providing shovel money, that means that whoever I'm sharing this idea with would have to be bound in some way. Um, if they're, if they're at least if they're ethically, them. yeah. For example, if we actually do continue and move forward with something. It would be under an arrangement where, um, suppose um, a publishing company were to get behind this. Knowing the plan, that there's, there's a number of organizations that might be able to take this forward, CSI being one of them, and then, then maybe two others. Um, so they would, I mean, they would take somebody from their own staff and send them over. I mean, it wouldn't make sense so to take money to out of a piece of intellectual property here. There has to be something that has value that you own mm -hmm. so you're protected Makes and sense. have the right to go to court okay. because you never know who you're going to share this with. Mm -hmm. So there's a, right off the bat who you're talking to, there's this ethical question, you know, are they going to run, can they steal this and run away mm -hmm. with it? Mm -hmm. That's why you need a Deep Pockets partner. It's funny that you mentioned that again. I uh, when we as since we've been targeting mobile platforms with the project we're doing in Luxembourg, mm -hmm. we're looking at also how what does the app business look like for educational games. Incidentally, that's where my son specializes in is venture capital. Okay, mobile platforms. He's in the sensor business. That gives you an interesting perspective on the world. What's happening in the world of sensors? Mm -hmm. Now, Burke just mentioned. First time I've thought of it, what's happening in the world of tattoos? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, wouldn't be interested. I remember once I was sitting on a committee giving out money to people in Ontario for entrepreneurial business ideas and the, the tattoo proposals were the ones we dismissed immediately. This was 20 years ago. I had no idea where we were. So this is the businessman saying, tattoo industry, holy crap, it's big. It's, it's billions of dollars. Where did it come from? Out of nowhere. Maybe out of New Zealand, I don't know. But, so that's the, um, that's the, the perspective. Uh, if you had a billion dollars in your pocket, I hope one day you do, you might be motivated to back this project. You stick, in, stick with it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. How'd you get there? How did, what turned you on? What did? What was your? What was the insight? And that's, I think, one of the targets for our activities is that very person with a billion dollars, who somehow magically we could turn on because this project needs that kind of backing. The shovel money problem is huge. You, you can't spend very many hours on it. I don't have very many hours left. I'm retired, you know, I gotta. I still have to work in the afternoon. But it's worthwhile to pursue. Burke started out saying, why, why are we pursuing this? I, it's, it must be in our genes. And this is really interesting. Where are we? We're sitting here in North York and we've got a world-changing idea. I don't think there are too many folks sitting around drinking coffee talking about world-changing ideas. Mm -hmm. And this one, I think, has merit. If you take the intellectual property, which overwhelmingly, we're talking about the existence of a dynamic tattoo that does not exist. So 
stone. It has trademark possibilities and it may have other intellectual ways of protecting it. You have to have the money not only to get the protection but to deal with any infringements. Mm -hmm. So, but we, basically out of it will come proprietary, potential proprietary things. Um, whether that's whether you leave it open for public domain or not is a question. We're talking about licensing the symbol itself. The symbol itself, protecting it first it, of all. Protecting it because you don't own it here. We're talking here about an idea that it's got commercial value. There are going to be dynamic tattoos come into existence and sold. How quickly will the Chinese jump in? Totally unethically into a marketplace where there's billions of dollars to be made and they're not under any control. And that's, that's a risk. Mm -hmm. from, a, from a contribution standpoint, you say fine. Because all of a sudden, if you understand the curve, you will, there's a possibility of turning on a younger generation understanding the value of the normal curve and statistical. It could be putting in the hands of the Chinese is exactly what you want to do. <laughs> you you want it to be ripped off. You see, right now you want the distribution. <laughs> well, so for now your strategy then should include somehow a magical secret release to the Chinese tattoo industry, right? Because <laughs> there's billions of dollars to be made. You whisper it, and, and they do. They take it. And you say, <laughs> that's what we wanted. <laughs> Different strategy from raising money, right? Mm -hmm. I think the bird's here, right? You're, you're feeling some heat? It's on your shoulder, that's why. you got to put the hat over here. Oh, over there is okay. <laughs> I don't need it. It's not on your head yet. You like that? <laughs> I noticed. If you take the correspondence, have you looked at the correspondence of... Uh, fields, the mass form. Oh, the, the, the one from this week. I'm sorry? The one from this week. Uh, yeah. How do we know? Where Ian. What, what are you talking about? The center? Yeah. The, the changing the, ti the title of the place? Well, Ian, no, what Ian uh, said is suggesting why, why are we teaching mathematics? Good question. Mm -hmm. I can, we have an ans answer in what we're doing. In what we're doing, you're teaching the answer is why should you be teaching statistics? It's a bad name. And if you're teaching statistics, you better be teaching math too. Mm -hmm. We have an answer. Why. If you want to make decisions in life and contend with it, inequality, you better have the background to understand what's causing it. That requires an understanding normal curve and such. I think you'll sometime in your lifetime you'll sit back and you'll remember this conversation. <coughs> I think what we're talking about will occur whether we do anything or not. <coughs> I learned something interesting yesterday. There's a new program. Um, two young scientists um, One's a biologist and the other one, can't remember what he is, maybe he's a geologist, and they travel around the world and answer the question, that, how did we get here, or the history of the world, something to that effect. And what they explained yesterday I had, hadn't been exposed to before was how the English Channel was formed. Because England used to be connected to Europe. Mm -hmm. The 
that be? And I, I, I've taken geology, but they didn't know any of this stuff at the time. I took geology in the 19, early 1960s. Thank you very much. You're very good. Apparently, just west of the Great Lakes, there was another lake, five times larger, created by the melting ice cap at the end of the Ice Age, about 30,000 years ago. And that lake was um, surrounded on all sides by ice. It wasn't sitting in a basin like the Great Lakes, it was sitting in an ice basin. Mm -hmm. And it was humongous. And one day, they, there's evidence of this. I don't know what the evidence is. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what the evidence is. Anyway, that, that ice dam holding this gigantic lake in place broke. And there was so much water that it rushed across where the Great Lakes are now, out the St. Lawrence Basin, and raised the level of the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> People working in the valley between England and Europe were boat builders making dugouts. And they've just recently discovered the workshop with the boat half finished submerged under the English Channel that the entire community maybe without much of a warning because it was like the tide you know the tide comes in tide goes out well one day the tide didn't stop coming in and that was the day that that huge lake collaped. I don't know how long it took it probably took hours or maybe even days to get across to, to England just mind-boggling and it raised the level of the Atlantic Ocean by, I forget what it was, 30, 40, 50 feet, something like, something yeah. like that, and changed the map of the world. Right? And it was just near the end of the last ice age. Hello there, Burke. Hi, Clara. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. I think you've met David Hello. before, my nephew. How are you? Yes, Hi. we have. And yes. Charles, I think you've met before, too. Hi. Yes, Hi. take care. Nice to see you. Yeah. Enjoy yes, the day. you too. Thank you. Yeah, so big things happen in the world, eh? And things well, are and never the same the, afterwards. The way they find these things out is really quite, quite amazing. Um, they were looking for evidence re related to the last ice age. There's another thing as part of this program. There's a description of I've never heard before called Snowball Earth. You ever heard it? There's evidence now that the entire Earth, at one point in time, was covered with ice. Not just caps at the bottom and top, but the entire Earth. And in order to prove it, where'd they go? To Death Valley, the hottest place on Earth in the United States. And what did they find in Death Valley? A huge glacial erratic. What's a glacial erratic? It's a large rock. It's an erratic, it's in the wrong place. Okay? And you see them all around the city. When you look at a house and you see a huge rock that they didn't bring in by truck, it was dropped by the glacier. It cost me 500 bucks. It cost you 500 bucks. Some of them are trucked in, but I had a glacial erratic on my property in North York, and, and it was a very large boulder, bigger than these, not cut, okay? And clearly, clear evidence it's too heavy for any human or any water to move it can only be moved by ice and where'd they find it in death valley and that's proof that there was a glacier at one point in time in the history of the earth in death valley the hottest place on earth mm -hmm. and to me it's just the research is really fascinating how the hell can they tell and they know the age of the rock and they know where it came from Right? It came from a thousand miles away, or I don't know, 800 miles, some, somewhere quite, quite far away. It just blows me away. Nothing to do with human behavior, just human understanding. Well, solutions we don't have. <laughs> but I, as I'm thinking, and I'm just repeating, and what can I do at this stage? And uh, I think is have these conversations. And uh, you want to mix it in. No, mix it with your fork. It doesn't mix itself. 
the piece of brown that I take that away for you? Yep. So for dessert, we have an ice cream sundae. Yes? Would you like? For you. That's okay. Some more coffee one? for you guys? No, oh, sorry. More Thank you. No, I'll have, thanks, I'll have a part of green tea. Yeah. No, in fact, chamomile tea. Chamomile tea. And um, do you have some blackberries? Yeah, I can check. Yeah. All right, thanks. Some blackberries? Yes. And you said no to coffee, right? Mm. Okay. I'll take that away for you then. I, I don't know what else to suggest at this stage because um, I, uh, for the reasons that I mentioned before. Mm. Well, I, I, I need to mention something also. the. Um, the competition that was being run up until June kind of forced me to block my attention away from anything else um, in terms of outside of Reda. Yes. You know, and so I would feel very stupid spending time on something that wasn't towards that. Yes. Uh, it, during that time. That was a critical time. It was a critical time. <laughs> You're referring to our competition? Yes. Yes. Um, of course, there's a lot of other things happening at the same time. Sophie's growing up, uh, Breda's trying to grow its own wings, <laughs> all those <laughs> different things. Uh, yeah. I do feel though I'm at a time now that um, I, need to, I need to maintain something like this. Uh, my only question though is how can I, how can I share it so that, um, uh, so that it's not stuck with me. Uh, my only fear there is that uh, from your own experience, you're saying that's not a good strategy <laughs> to look for someone to share it with before we move forward with something. Because well, what, I you, think I, what are you sharing you it? Forward. What are you sharing it for? To raise capital or to uh, look for an intellectual buddy? A Nick, somebody to work to, to put it together. To well, just a second now. Yeah. Oh, I see. I I think that's a hard question. Well, in in a way, yes. In a way, no. Uh, I've come to the conclusion, and David's seen this time and time again, that it's like titrating. And I wake up in the morning and <laughs> I better get it off my mind if I can. Um, so, to me, uh, a watershed is coming to the conclusion that if you have a limited time and you have two directions in which to go, one involves getting the tattoo made and the other involves words. Don't go down the, the complex route. Don't go down the word route. Don't go down the word route. Because Too many people have gone down the word route from Ecclesiastes on. <laughs> because words, words <laughs> won't work. They haven't worked. You know the professor, the mythical professor that Burke created? Professor Words Won't Work? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Wordsworth, but it's Professor <laughs> Dr. Words Won't Work. That's an interesting thought. Mm. Words don't communicate, especially when you have language boundaries, but even English-speaking people speaking to other English-speaking people what I'm saying is not necessarily what you're hearing or what I mean is not necessarily what you interpret. Words are nowhere near as good as pictures, for instance. That's, so okay. that's the psychologist talking, you know, so what's the best way to communicate? It's not with words, it's with physical objects, pictures, movies, Multimedia, your your simplified cartoon, you know, that you made, beautiful. Wasn't terribly sophisticated, but it had an extra added dimension to it in a very short period of time. I, I compliment you for that. That that's brilliant, and um, that's the that's why words don't work. That's a, that's the message. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, Burke, go ahead. So you, you go down the physical... Well, I, I think there's, the there, there's certain things that I think... First of all, I, I think if we do nothing more than record these conversations, we're doing something. Pre preferably, I think, visual, because it just adds another uh, dimension. And so that's... A, 
one thing, if, if we do nothing but spend our time getting that clear. I think we, we have to have some, when I say have to, it's always in quotation marks. We have to have a record of why do we think this is important. I think that should be written out and we agree. Because in whomsoever we're going to enlist, they have to feel this important. And I think we, we should have the importance clear in our own mind. What's driving us and why do, why do we think it's important? And uh, the discipline of getting that written out is important. So that's a gain before we try to enlist them. Because I think they... I think they have to buy into why we think this is important. But building the tattoo could be something completely different. Well... <laughs> you, I mean, you realize that. The, the tattoo... The, the point is that the sooner that... If that tattoo was available today, mm -hmm. we could make a lot more progress. And we could keep more easily focused. We'd have this meeting and it'd be on our heads. And that will control us. Would, would, you, be, would you be ready to, to get the tattoo done? If it, it, would, it would be removable, so it doesn't. Okay. Well, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, sure. It's, you lick it and you stick it on your forehead for the meeting and you take it off and you go outside because you'll be misinterpreted, right? <laughs> and would the, instead of it being Ash Wednesday, it'll be Bash Wednesday. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I, you know, this. Uh, I, I consider it such a privilege just to be able to talk about this sort of thing. How did we get to this stage? <laughs> it's like to this guy here. No, this. I mean, if we didn't have this dialogue. Well, if you didn't give your statistics professors such pain in university, <laughs> we wouldn't be sitting here. You had the gall to to say, you know, why five percent? Where does that come from? And they said, shut up and do your homework. <laughs> it's publishable. Never mind. <laughs> Why isn't it replicated? Shut up. Who's got money to do that? <coughs> I can publish it without replicating it. <laughs> they just announced last week a Viagra pill for women. And did you see the announcement? It's a yes, Canadian sir, yeah. firm has invested a billion dollars in this pill. And the first doctor they talked to was from either St. Michael's or Sunnybrook, young guy. <coughs> and he said, uh, that I think history will look back at this as a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and then he Did said, "Did he say are, why?" Yes, yeah, so, uh, the side effects and and uh, the statistical results are not clear. He said it might help only one in ten women. <laughs> right? Who's, what woman is going to take a chance on that? Well, this is the point. Maybe lots of them will. This is this is why they're investing. You know. Oh, and the side effects could be. Uh well, they, they said, oh, yeah, we're going to put all the side effects there. You can, he you can hear the commercial now. You know, you could die from this. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't you seem die smiling. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really, really sad. I think we need spoons, eh? <laughs> Some spoons? A couple of spoons when you have yeah. a mow. Thank you. Uh... So yeah, that's a big question for me, because uh, I, I actually spoke to Anand um, during the summer, uh, in June. I said, Anand, and this was back when I was hedging my bets with the company, not sure. Uh, in fact, wanting to put him on the edge a little bit. Um, I said, Anand, I'm thinking of going back to school. Who would uh, you say this to? Uh, Anand, my partner in Breda. Mm. Um, and? He's, the, he's the majority stakeholder, so I said, I'm thinking of going back to school at some point. Uh, you, were you watching his eyes at the moment? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I told him actually the place I'd, I'd go if I, if I went back to school would be, uh, without a doubt, uh, the MIT Media Lab. Uh, yes. Because they've got a really interesting uh, yeah. mix between the physical yeah. implementations and put, putting, this to, put it, putting these things out as products and media. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so when we talk about a dynamic tattoo, like literally I'm thinking in my mind, what if I spent what? six months doing that kind of thing? That, that uh, would be one of the best places to go. 
No question. You can have the resources to really put something together. Thanks very much. Thank you. And you'd like to get the shovel money there too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was where the fellow, uh, I think you showed us that uh, research work where they were uh, analyzing all the words that were mm. coming out in the news media mm -hmm. to track what was happening. And he, um, he, tra he traced the, la the words that his little boy was learning. Right over the evolution a year or two over years. Yeah. yeah, the evolution of uh, using I forget the word was water or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, they're very they're they're really at the front edge. Now, did, you get a, did you get a reaction from your partner? Or? I think the um, I think it, it uh, made him uh, think about the urgency of building up a team. Um, mm -hmm. Because you know I've left the company before. Oh um, yes. And it put it put it put the company in a bad state um, when I did that. Yes. So I'm saying he hasn't really thought about it, that issue <laughs> since that time. Uh, so it, it's <laughs> you got his attention. <laughs> so we um, we spent the summer investing um, in, in building a team, and um, you know we had a, a a little disagreement over how the team should be built. Uh, and, and isn't it hard to find good people? Uh, it is. It is. But I think if you focus on uh, putting it together the right way, mm -hmm. so looking for the people that actually exist <laughs> rather than people who don't exist. So for example, if I look for someone who's exactly like me, I'm never going to find <laughs> them. <laughs> but if I, find, if I look at what is it yeah. that we're doing and how yes. could a team work together, Yes. Uh, and then we try it out with a few people that are highly qualified, and you, again, have, the, and you have a cash flow to play, yeah, allows you to play around. We've got the cash flow to do that right now. Yeah. Um, but what you don't want to do is where you take two unqualified people and see if you can work together. <laughs> and then you, <laughs> you don't know if it's the skill yeah. or if it's the role that, that's yeah. not working. Which is what we've done in the past. But I'm very... I'm very much focused on that now. I'm finding that um, I'm getting towards um, the end, like of my contribution for this company, of being able to, to cap it off at some point. Um, How far away is that? It's as far as away of, of, of a team that could that could produce. How far away is that? Um, I think six months or so. Really, I mean, I'm seeing the team is able to produce now. I've and got the project, that big project yeah. in, in Luxembourg, is yeah. is running on its own. That's no. So I'm very heavily involved in that. Uh, so how come you're here right now? Yeah, because it's summer vacation. Oh, so it's an academic environment. Yeah. Ah, so they have summer too, like we do. A lot of the teachers are seconded, uh, and also a lot of people just take vacation. Their vacation during I the summer. See. Am I okay? Yes, it's just in. It's just to your right side, but I guess it's moving towards you. So will it pick up again, I guess, in September? Well, it's, yeah. yeah and I, what I did is I took advantage of this time to focus on the team. I see. So, so that will I, you have I to be commuting? Will you have to stay there for an extended I'm, period of I'm time? I'm going to stay there for uh, around two to three weeks at a time. And then I'll come back uh, for about a week and then go back. That's exactly what my son is doing. So his between wife, Toronto and... His wife is in Richmond Hill with two daughters. Okay. They were with, living with him in California. She wanted to come back home. Her mother, my son's mother-in-law, said to me, I quote, my stupid daughter, which took me by surprise. She said her place is with her husband. So Kevin comes back home one week each month. So he's in California for three weeks running the business and then he's here for one week. And it seems to be working out. It's just a lot of time in airplanes. It's a big stress on a marriage, you know. Uh, and you so know, I, I hope you're able to do that without, without the stress. Yeah, I, I think the, the the space is is good for us. Um, you Google. use uh, Viber or Skype or yeah, FaceTime. All kinds of things. WhatsApp and Skype is the so, biggest one. Yeah, so you have connection yeah. daily. Yeah, that's very good. And I think. Um, Makes it easier, eh? The attitude is, is really probably one of the most important things. Is you know, if I um, if I take the work so seriously that I ignore her, um, it's it's a uh, it's even more difficult to bear that when I'm sitting right next to her. 
<laughs> compared to um, mm -hmm. I'm just not responding to an email yeah. right away. Um, it's, uh, You're talking about your daughter or your wife? Uh, uh, both. both. <laughs> well, Sophie, you know, yeah. it, Sophie was concerned that he was going away again. At, at not three yet. How old is she now? She's going to be three in a few days. Son of a gun. <laughs> Goes by fast, eh? Yeah. Yeah, the night I came back uh, from the last, from the long trip, uh, I'd gone to bed a little bit early <laughs> in the living room. And she said, did, did, did Papa leave again? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> That's like, oh, there's a message, eh? You don't expect someone that age to have that insight. She's quite, she's quite aware as a child. Like, I've noticed she's, she's surprised um, my parents also like I was. Um, I'd, I'd take I'd taken her to my parents' house so that I can I can focus on some work and um, uh, so they're they're going in the car and I just put her in the car seat and she said she said Papa you can't sit here there's no, there's no more room so <laughs> the car's full you, you gotta you know, stay home <laughs> okay I was planning to but <laughs> you good. thanks for noticing. <laughs> So my mom was surprised by that, that she'd noticed that the, all the seats in the car were full, sitting from where she was. <laughs> yeah, chip off the old block. <laughs> That's interesting. I, th I think if, if we come to some conclusion here that, that from my standpoint, if we can have dialogue, we can record dialogue, if we can come to something, conclusion on something manageable, for instance, such as, you know, doing whatever we can to record, each one of us perhaps separately, on uh, why is this important? I, I think, I think having clarity with that and being able to share it with whomsoever we want to enlist it is, is important. And um, I think this aspect of, uh, that bothers me of uh, getting caught up in words and if, if, I, if I was active and I had a bifurcation, in other words, I'm in a causal, I can go left, I can go right. If I go right, I'm going words, if I go left, I'm, I'm going product, tangible. I would go, I'd go product. I can't do both at the same time. And there's been too many thousands of years of history of words not working. So I don't want to gamble. Okay, so if I got a chance of making this intangible, tangible, it, it's just a better bet from my standpoint. It'd be the wrong bet, mm -hmm. but that's where I'd go. So I have three options in front of me, Bert. One is I can find a way of externalizing this so that I, I share, I find ways of sharing it either with like a CSI or some some group that can take it, you know, Scholastic, some some publishing company. The, I was mentioning I didn't get into it properly, but there was um, the I was looking into the app industry and understanding the, the, the uh, app uh, yes. mobile app industry, and I'm trying to un get my head around where it's at right now, mm -hmm. and for the, for educational products just to see what's what's the appetite in the consumer market to buy this stuff. Uh, and I found one company that's really dominating. Uh, in fact, I look at most of the stuff, it's really pretty bad, um, mm -hmm. stuff that's, that's being released. Um, and this Mostly is the from one off, the one-off inventor type things, yeah. right? Yeah, a lot of the so stuff. So there is a big player in the app industry? There is one, uh, mm -hmm. and I was uh, shocked to see the... How did you find them? Well, the production, well, I mean, they're topping the charts. Uh, I see. So I would look at the charts and I'd see who's like who's there, and then are they good? Um, and so these guys—and it's guys, a company, is it? It's a company. It's called Tokoboka. And one, the thing that impressed me so much about them was they created a persistent brand between the different, the different apps and the different games. So you can you can tell right away that you're in hmm. one of their products, um, which speaks to the immersion. The way I'm talking about this, is, you know, when you're in an app, you're in an app, you're in it. Um, uh, when you open it up, um, but the, when I looked into it, I realized. So I thought that they would be maybe a startup 
or something like that. Not at all. Hmm. So uh, as, a, as a publishing uh, company in Sweden, uh, so they were approached by two designers, uh, uh, and they went ahead and created this new branch, which operates pretty much independently as far as the creative direction goes. This, this is for apps? For this one line of app called Toka Boca. I see. And uh, they just completely built that thing. And How do you spell that? Dominating. It's uh, T O C C A uh, B O C C A. A Swedish company. Swedish. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's, the, what's their most popular app? Do you know? Mm. They're getting into these virtual worlds now. So they've got this one called. Uh, it's all Toka something, so there's Toka Lab, so you likes that one. I see. Uh, so it's got like a periodic table, and you're transforming this little creature by putting, like freezing him, like oh. frying him, put all kinds of stuff. And there's another one, Toka Kitchen, uh, where Sophia loves that one too, where you, uh, um, uh, you, you have like this, you, take, you can take this food and do different things to it. You can fry it, you can boil it, and then it reacts accordingly. Uh, and then you can put together like, uh, pretty much meals that this monster will eat and the, the funny thing is even as a parent when you kind of overlooking and seeing how the kid is playing with it um, the kid will make some disgusting thing but it makes sense because it's a monster that's eating it so you don't have to actually <laughs> yeah. follow like specific or, recipes yeah, you can just have fun you know stick it in the microwave fry it chop it up you know do whatever um, and have fun with it so yeah so I think they, they, they're doing a really good job of uh, bringing the illustration in, getting good production quality, which is what I was trying to bring to uh, the Vreta product, um, which is why I hired a design firm called uh, Thought Cafe to, to do our, our, uh, our artwork for the latest, uh, latest project. Uh, so that continued for two months, um, just about two months. By the third week, Anon wanted to pull the plug on it because uh, we were paying $70,000 uh, per annum mm -hmm. for a uh, designer, which is a really good, really good rate. Um, he but he wasn't seeing a result. Um, I think he wanted to get it done for cheaper because he wanted to do other products, which was what mm -hmm. the big tension was was about. It was I was I went ahead and pulled the plug. We got an internal designer instead. She's not as experienced, um, but we're going to develop her. She's going to mm -hmm. be part of the team, which I think is important. Uh, I'm, I'm again, I'm nervous about that aspect of me having to be there to make things work. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm happy about how that's gone. It's not, I don't really regret it. But it's, it's, um, it's made it more difficult for us to produce that kind of uh, market-ready product that you know if this person, this designer who's working on it, if she does it, she, you know, I don't have anything to worry about. It's gonna be time well spent, money well spent. Mm -hmm. With this one, we're talking about developing someone internally. You don't know. Slow like sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't work. But we have to move on with the product. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know for sure, if I were taking that strategy today, I would definitely, if I'm going for a market product, I would definitely go with a uh, trusted solution that's, you know, uh, rather than trying to an internal person it. rather than on contract? Uh, mm, I guess, it's hard to say, like I think there's a certain management skill that's coming out of uh, the design firm's ability, um, but I think it's also the experience of the, of the artist as well. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, we found another artist at the same kind of price point, um, but the work just wasn't at the same level. So I don't know. I think it's a motivation thing. Uh, so I think designers have this higher sense of prestige if they're working at a big design firm than if they're working for something that doesn't seem related to their field. It's kind of like programmers. I mean, you feel better about working at a Google than working at like Zurich, you know, like an insurance company or something like that. Um, so I think that has a role to play, but if you do the marketing for the project right, you can you can hire directly into it. So what's the bottom line? Your preference is to use the expertise of outside contractors uh, until you can until you can sell the project well enough to okay. get someone uh, who wants it. Maybe more expensive, but you may get shorter timelines. Yeah, and a higher quality product. That's right. More suit. Yeah. yeah. So you can you can narrow the you can just narrow the scope of the project. But it bit. cost you more. And you'll get no. It costs about the same. Oh, really? You narrow, you narrow yeah. the pro scope of the project a little bit, and you'll, mm -hmm. you'll cost you less actually. Because if you're redoing work and stuff like that with mm -hmm. a junior person, just to get to the thing, it's, mm -hmm. it's anyway it's costing you some, a lot of money. Um, so out of that, I mean, I see three things. <coughs> um, one is, is trying to find 
find ways of externalizing this, um, which is something that can always continue. You're referring to what we're doing? What we're doing. Yeah. Uh, finding ways of externalizing that to find other people who might be interested, uh, that's really tough. I don't, I'm not, I'm really not skillful at that at all. Well, but even doing so, it's very time consuming. Yeah. Finding them and time consuming establishing a relationship. Go ahead. So I, my, um, my preference would be uh, two other scenarios, which is one is um, uh, running with the story myself and uh, starting to put together at least the theme the, of, of the characters. Um, and that's something that could be done, I, I mean, I, I would feel pretty comfortable pitching something like that to a publishing company or something. Uh, where I, I can already have, uh, I can put together the illustrations, I can put together something that will make it clear to their minds that there's a kind of a merchandising opportunity here uh, that, that we could go forward with. Are um, publishers interested in the merchandising side? I think the, the, right one, the ones that are dealing with it, yeah. I mean, yeah. the ones that already have that kind of business will understand what that means. Uh, the ones who don't... Would you, in other words, a publisher that would be interested in, in the movie deal. Right. <laughs> They've got to be around. Yeah. Whether it's going to become a movie. Release. I think. But the difference there is that I hear it's, I have the immediate means of production mm -hmm. to get into a pitch that is fairly concrete for somebody to buy into. That's, that's what I see as the biggest differentiator. Mm -hmm. um, the other option is, uh, the third option that I'm seeing like right now is um, where we go, where I, literally I, I mean, I, I quit uh, what I'm doing now. And uh, I build the tattoo. <laughs> we get that funded. Yeah, not a no, good idea. That's no, not a good no, idea. No, it's, it, it's too risky. Until yeah. Bill Gates writes you a check, <laughs> then no. you then you could do it. But what I I think there's something prior to each of the three alternatives. Yes. I I think we should have written consensus among the three of us uh, of certain things, despite the fact. Now, over the years, I've been criticized that I study a thing to death and lose the opportunity. But th this whole idea of what we're involved with is uh, so foreign to current thinking that I, I think if we do no nothing else than record where I'm at, if, that is, we set our sights fairly low. We record where I'm at and where, where I change, and w we record where you're at, because uh, we're three individuals looking at something where we think we have consensus, but are we, are we seeing the same thing? Uh, we are motiv highly motivated. Why? And Why is that important? Because having clarity and agreement we, will help us sell this thing. I see. Okay. But we'll all be on the same pitch. Mm. So uh, I, I think that having these dialogues, having some agreement, like uh, uh, do we agree that the question is why is this important? Should be someplace where somebody can see it, even if it's just the three of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, why is it a turn on? Mm -hmm. uh, ideas may come when, when we try to verbalize. I, I think there's, it has a pedagogical value of, of making statistics meaningful. But th this is where, how, why? I mean, I'd have to work on it, but I, my gut tells me uh, that. I see. Work, you're getting a lot of sun now. Yeah. Well, uh, either move. Am I getting it on? Here? No, it's just it's starting to get onto your neck now and your shoulder. Oh. But it's, I'm sure it's getting warm. Would you like to move to the I'll other side? And maybe I'll get over. What's the timing, uh, Charles? Do you have to depart soon? It's. I have to be downtown at four. At four, so it's one forty now. No, it's what is it? Two forty. Two forty. Two thirty nine. So in twenty minutes, I, I should I should probably get. There. So, uh, should we go upstairs or stay here? Let's stay here. Okay. You, do you have a preference? No, it's all right. This could be. Might be outside. I'll go perhaps. Or I go. either there or here, Bert. Well, wherever. I'll uh, move. Why should you move? Well, it, it, because if this is closer for you. Is there a cushion there? Yeah. 
For you? Yeah, I'm okay. David, do you want to take your stuff? So you can see, I mean, I'm, I'm going a little bit into what, where oh, I'm at. Yeah. But you can see where, because we've been, this has been on my mind uh, for the past several years now, um, you know, some way or another, my thinking is, is melding together in terms of what is the business opportunity for what I'm doing at Vreda and what is the, the business opportunity for the story that we're talking about. Uh, and to me, it's, it's coming down to, um, uh, it's coming down to a uh, pretty much a, a character-based brand that uh, will have recognizable, a recognizable world uh, that people, uh, that specifically kids, um, would engage with and, and also remember. So even if it's something that is only experienced during the childhood or is associated with childhood things, I've seen the precedent again and again and again, at least with my generation, where those things come back to roost um, and you end up with, uh, uh, you know, Mario, Lord of the Rings, all these kind of just story things, but becoming a really big part of people's lives uh, as, as they go on. And I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, that idea of, say, like a role, a role playing game like Dungeons and Dragons has had a major effect on the psyche of a lot of the people who've been influenced of yeah. thinking in terms of attributes and points and, you know, experience and things kind of being so systematic. Actually, you know, it's a model for the thinking about the world, which is not a, it's a fiction. But, I mean, a lot of people actually live their lives by that fiction, and sometimes... Well, all of us do live our lives by our fiction. Mm -hmm. It is fiction. We have limitations. I think it's a useful fiction. It's just funny when you realize the holes in it, but then, otherwise, it, it is. It's a useful fiction itself. I, I think that... Uh, we have, in a way, three generations here. Mm -hmm. And each... will cup bring something, and to see if we can share it. Uh, I, my, my, because of the nature of this thing and the absence of tangibility and simplicity that uh, of focusing somehow or other and finding out what's involved in getting this tattoo made uh, is something that my intuition tells me to, to do. I don't know if I can verbalize it all, but that's... Might go viral. <laughs> that's always the dream, eh? The other thing is, I do, uh, do look up the Granting Institute, the one that ran the contest. What's it called? Oh, the Granting uh, Express? Yes. Do look, and go through the site. When you see who's associated with it, mm -hmm. you got Cameron associated with it. Um, you have uh, the inventor of the uh, what's that mobile device that you stand on um, Segway? Segway he's there and you know and he has an causal in his place so you have people who are highly motivated to do something contributory if we were clear enough in our own thinking uh, traveling to organizations like that so we could put our problem in front of them and get their feedback. Because one of the things I've learned and was put forth by a, a, a coach by the name of Barbara Shear is, is um, share your problem with others. What's the coach's name? Barbara Shear. Oh, Barbara Shear, yeah. yeah. Have it's you heard of her, Charles? No. Uh, she was in town and I met her, thanks to Burke. She's a published author, um, sort of in the self-help industry. Her first book was called, um, uh, what was it, Burke? You can, <laughs> I forget. it was Wishcraft, called yeah. Wishcraft. You can do anything that you'd like as long as you know what it is. Something like that, sort of like self-help, but also motivation and career planning. Mm -hmm. 
and she ran a workshop which we participated in and she's been all around the world doing these workshops and her the byline uh, for this is if you need advice ask a stranger don't, don't ask someone who already knows you and in the workshop 100 people in the room and uh, she coached everybody to uh, walk around the room and pick someone you don't know and go up to them and say my dream is to become a pilot but I don't know where to get started right? and the noise level in the room <laughs> went way up and what she discovered was that this random connection between people produced some magical things the person who said she wants to be a pilot happens to live in a town where there's a small uh, airstrip and her husband was a tr trainer and a teacher and she knew all about it right and this story this has been repeated over and over again so if you want some advice ask a stranger and you, ne you never know what's going to come out of it and and uh, she wrote a couple of books since then I think she came down with cancer I don't know if she's still around but that that um, that lesson uh, Burke has always taught me never ask for a job if you're out of work never ask for a job only ask for advice. The job will fall. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Never ask for never ask for a job because they'll put you down. They'll send you off to the personnel department. Go to someone and say, you know, I've studied your career and your business, and and uh, I admire you. Uh, this is what I'm thinking of. Got any ideas? Not looking for a job. My best success in the business huddle business was a pretty young girl with a master's in business came to me through the a fellow board member at the University of Waterloo in the Innovation Center and she, uh, I did a huddle for her and she said her dream uh, was to uh, get into the banking business in the Cayman Islands. So I sent her down there and she stayed there for a while and uh, giving her the advice, the advice I got from Burke, never ask for a job, just ask for advice. She happened to bump into the guy who was the founder of the Cayman Islands banking industry because Cayman is now the Switzerland of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, I got a friend over here, blah, blah, blah. So she went over to Coots Bank, which is a famous and very old English bank. And she became the director of, of marketing for Coots Bank in the Caribbean. And I attribute her, the success of that coaching to uh, never ask for a job, just ask for advice. And that was Barb. That's Barbara Shear's main theme, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very interesting to read her stuff. There's an interesting story she tells because she helps people in terms of they're asking her for advice. So there was this one woman who was constantly despondent, and she she was you know kept kept on asking, "What's your dream? What's your dream? I don't have it. I don't have it." One day she was talking to Barbara Shear, and she was growing elegant over gorillas. She over. was gorillas. She was She had a book under her. She was yes, she had a book with it. Yeah. She was at you go ahead and tell her. So Barbara was trying to find out from this girl, what's your passion? You know, that's the whole idea. What was your passion? And then this woman her her face lit up, her eyes lit up, her expressions became animated when she's talking about these either gorillas or chimpanzees or something like that. And Barbara Shear found out what she needed to know. And I think it was in Boston, and Barbara knew someone, or, or they were somehow connected to the zoo, and there was a program starting there where people, volunteers could come in and take care of the chimpanzees, mm -hmm. and that's where this girl, <laughs> that's where she directed her, and changed her life. And it was just a, a perfect example of the kind of thing, what's your passion? You know, you ask, what's your passion? And she found this girl's passion with the animation and it, and it was a wonderful wonderful story and her health improved and everything else it was good. I don't know if she made any money at it but the point is that she was able to tap in to the passion and it was because of Barbara Sher's discovery ask a stranger we have a passion related to this I think we should in order I think it has to be clear to us in our own way and has to be transferable when we go to talk to anyone else yeah. or ask for help. For me, I you mean, it, it comes to the, the idea of like, I think uh, being smart shouldn't be a privilege. I mean, you should be able to have access to basic understanding that allows you to not, not, 
not make really bad decisions or be, you know, be dumb about stuff. Um, and so the, uh, for me, that's part of it is just kind of sharing that. But the other thing is uh, when you look at the compounding effect, uh, especially this is, one, this, is what, this is that kind of pro project that from a personal level, it's useful to know. Like, where do I stand and why? Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at the compounding effect of what can this actually do to establish something like the Golden Rule, uh, which only works if everybody respects it, um, it's, uh, it adds another layer to it for me. It. It adds another layer to it for me, yeah. which isn't there in most of the other work that I'm doing. Well, Elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say that you landed this contract in Luxembourg because of something that you were saying in an elevator? <laughs> someone uh, overheard you? Uh, it wasn't no, no not, not, exactly. not exactly. Not exactly. Okay, okay. I thought it was something <laughs> like that. Anyway, but, but it was it was a it was pretty much an elevator pitch. Um, and I, I mean, talking about that, it's funny because we had um, the project that we had as a run up to that that I showcased. Um, we almost didn't actually showcase it. Uh, the, the person who was directing the project, uh, his name's Graham Orpwood. Uh, he's a researcher, and uh, his, I mean, he's just he's just not used to showing the product. So he's just used to talking, mm -hmm. using words, and so he'd be working on his report, taking. And so when he would give people updates on the project, he would give them updates on his report. And so for the longest time, nobody actually saw the product, uh, who were involved in the CSAP project. Um, so this was actually the. F the second time that I had gone with him mm -hmm. and I made sure to show the product to people so they can see what it was. The, fir the, fir the time before that was the QAO and that was... So this was just demonstration, this wasn't making a presentation no, at I, a conference? I didn't, no, we did that too. Uh -huh. We did that too, but the, the, pretty much the sale was made before that happened. Um, so the sale was made by just me showing someone on, on the laptop what, what it is that we've done. Um, uh, but Who I, was it in the client organization? that picked up on this. So this was a the senior person, yeah. a junior a senior, senior person. person. The reason I ra raised the point, to me that's Charles' elevator pitch, because I have a picture of you in an elevator when you're talking and there's somebody listening, aha, we'll buy that. Mm. <laughs> if you can make it, we'll buy it, okay? So uh, the, the elevator pitch for this, you know, Burke has always said, Burke has never had a problem getting to the most senior person in an organization. It's a knack that he has and I've never had the guts to do it, but he always had the right words. When you talk about making a profit, you can get to anybody. And so there's a, there's a hit list in the world today for what we're talking about here. There's, there's somebody uh, that we would love to be in an elevator with that gets turned on by the tattoo movie. Okay, let's call it the tattoo movie. Now getting there requires shovel money. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm an optimist, I, Burke is too, that, that there may be a, a lower cost way, it's a rifle shot, right? Mm -hmm. There low, may be a lower cost way of getting this message, this deal, this contribution to mankind, right through to that person who's got lots of armor around them, you know, they've got secretaries and assistants and foundations and, you know, you just can't get to these folks unless you're in an elevator with them. <laughs> and they, <laughs> their ears perk up, right? So, so my dream is that that's possible. Luxembourg is a very interesting place for that point. For two reasons. One is I'm sorry, what? Uh, Luxembourg. Yes. Uh, one is if you the, the per capita income in that country is, is about ninety thousand euros. Very high. It's eh? Very very high. Uh, one of the highest in the world, maybe. I think yeah. it's the second. Uh, so Qatar is just above them. Really. Um, so it's it's interesting that that's the situation over there. <laughs> Uh, I took a look at their tax code because I know the, there's some people who are doing investments through there to, to save on taxes. Their corporate tax rate is 40%. Um, just to give perspective, it's 35% in the US. It's yeah. about 25 So 40 is high. 40 is really high. Um, but they've got a special clause for intellectual property, uh, which makes this a very attractive place for people to hold their um, uh, trademark assets or uh, software patents, those kinds of things. Uh, tax the tax on any patent income uh, or IP uh, IP licensing income is five percent. Really? For uh, and it's a special. Yeah. Uh, I guess you call it. Uh, it's called an IP box. Yeah. Or a Not patent for a box. For reason, I guess. Call, eh? call, call it patent box generally. Yeah. 
Um, and the, yeah, the reason is to it basically attracts. attract research and development yeah. into the into the country. Um, but it's I think that Did combination. You that? Uh, Did you know that? It's an interesting mix of things that yeah. that could make a does conversation that, there interesting. Is that does that set them out from from others? Are there very few countries? There's very few countries that? that do that. So I think one of them is uh, Ireland. Hmm. Ireland put something like that in place. They they were, they were able to attract a lot of uh, a lot of investment. Uh, That's from Google. I mean, I think Google's putting their stuff through there now. Really? Uh, they get criticized for it tremendously in the U.S. Yeah, because they're tax evaded. They're saying they're evading yeah. taxes. They'll probably lose the battle against the government. But that's a very interesting thing. That that could play well in our strategy here. Mm -hmm. This idea of making what we're doing tangible mm -hmm. sticks with me. Mm -hmm. Also, the fact that in the history of the world, the golden rule has never been effective. If we were back in history where people were superstitious, such as when Moses brought down the Ten Commandments, how is he going to get this unruly mass to obey social rule? So he creates these Ten Commandments. Uh, you have a trouble today with anybody religious saying, well, no, God did that. Well, whether God or other, it, it's effective. So the Ten Commandments become a symbol. And if we don't obey them, uh, what's the, the consequences? Now, we're in an era where we don't have the advantage of those consequences. We're also in an era where the church would likely be opposed to a lot of what we're talking about. Because when we refer to the acausal, for others it's God. It doesn't matter to us whether it's God or the acausal. The fact is that doesn't change things. So what hasn't happened in the history of the Golden Rule, it has not had an effective symbol, talisman, brand associated with it, standing on its own no matter what the religion is. And I think that has contributed to a degree, it's not the only thing contributing. Now, to create a brand with that type of character, I think is tough today because of the fact, of, I don't know how to do it. But I think in, motive, in in controlling us, I've had 60 years of not of having intangibles. It's a, a time to, to experiment with some tangibles. What's the strongest tangi uh, uh, symbol that you've seen in your own life? Uh, that you've seen around in the world? Well, there, there are many, but the swastika stands out in one. Because where do you get people to act as murderers? under the control of that. And that was all all thought out by Hitler. He was unfortunately brilliant in this regard, in knowing how to, what to do. On my day-to-day -day life, there's, there's no symbol that is as striking and you wouldn't think that it is as recognizable, but it is, and it has an impact, and it's the, the pride rainbow. I'm sorry? The, the pride rainbow. Yes. So when you see that in a shop window or you know, on the wall, like in a store um, uh, or in a school, um, it's an instant statement that's made of inclusion and respect. Yes. Which I don't think is matched by, uh, you know, the cross. I don't think it has that impact. But, no, you, but the cross... Today, today. It like what, I, what, what it does for me is that allows me to understand to some degree what the, what the cross might mean to others. Because for me, and I know probably a lot of my contemporaries, it doesn't, which for me... Just a minute. Kimberly, yeah? are we holding you back? No. Okay. Uh, no, yeah, no, you're not holding back. Okay, thank you. And so I'm just bringing that up as, as, a, well, as an example that I, I've felt, that I've seen, that I've understood. I, I think behind a lot of my thinking is the definition of religion in terms of symbols. So, and it's not too much reading. So, apropos to this, and it's underlying my decision process, is Sarah Voss' article on depolarizing mathematics and religion. We 
can talk about depolarizing because they, they were not polarized until the end of the uh, or the beginning of the uh, 19th century maybe the beginning of the 20th century really but never lie if we take Sarah Voss's definition and then go back to the source of her definition Geertz who was a, is a famous anthropologist and we take those two articles As difficult as it is to define mathematics, science, and religion, etc., I think both Geertz and Sarah have have caught on to something, and it, it is very much affecting my thinking. So when you say the cross, for you, yes, but when you read this definition, and some things that I think are missing that we would add. Uh, that, and we evaluate what's out there and what's controlling people. Uh, the symbols of the major face are the strongest in the world. And for the reasons I think outlined. Now, the, in their definition, they miss out certain things which I would go further which has to do with requisite variety, has to do with making things tangible that are not tangible, and has to do with what one author refers to as the narcotic effect of religion. And uh, you know, people are looking for answers. The world is not a safe place, it's not a happy place. And religion does a lot uh, to provide happiness and answers whether they're right or not, they give satisfaction. So, in giving the justification for uh, what we're doing, I think those two articles, one, one is a chapter from Geertz's book, and one is a, an article that Sarah wrote, uh, is, a, is a place for us to discuss. And I think that the absence of a symbol that meets that definition but refers specifically to the golden rule is one of the reasons the golden rule has not been effective. It's not the only reason. So by uh, doing fiction, because making assertions otherwise is self-defeating, I think. Doing fiction by giving this the symbolism, the tattoo we have in mind, these characteristics. We, we've got the liberty to, to put the idea out. So I, I would say that one of the things in answering the question, why is this important to us and why are we doing things, that this definition of religion in terms of symbols, and that takes us into the work of, of um, Dan Brown and his idea of um, Robert Langdon being a symbologist, which is not a, is a coined word. And the very, you know, the very brief introduction he has mm -hmm. could be could be one of the things we show in, in in explaining why why we're interested in doing what we want to do, why it's important to us. Um, these are the things I think I can share as verbally as much as I think verbal is not the way to go. But this is my limitation at the present time. So. Uh, it's a very short hop from verbal to concrete, if we're talking to the right people. It is, but uh, the fact that It's a that shorter I'm hop if it's visual. Yeah. <laughs> well, That's the, the, the point, right? You see, the fact... It was a giant step, from my standpoint in my career. Uh, there was a, a giant step, a watershed, among many things you've done. But just creating that animation with the girl with this, that's a watershed. That was uh, very good. It, 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 very it, well done. You, the cartoon that you started is the beginning of a watershed. It, all from another generation that's not open to me. So, uh, uh, coming to the conclusion that we have to make, we have to attenuate variety and make concrete that which is not. 
And I think we need it because if in turn we were the square or we were the iron filing, and we came back to the environment in which is our home and we're trying to apply, which is now something that is a memory, how, what a hell of a time we're going to have in trying to control our behavior and communicate to anybody else what it is. So we're a step ahead if in this fiction we, the person returns with some tangibility. The photograph. Yeah. And, and if we chance on a science fiction writer and we, they say, what are you up to? Immediately we take the picture you've got and we say, here's a person, they, like the square, have traveled to another dimension. And they have traveled, and after doing there, they, they were tattooed. And in that dimension, there's peace. They live by the golden rule. They have one symbol that represents everything, which has, and, and that is tattooed on everybody. And she and he have returned with this tattoo on their head. And then now they're faced with living back home. In, and we can refer to a causal land and causal land if we wish but that is going to control our behavior it's going to control our focus and, and what we use for communication have not had that experience never know quite uh, in speaking to my granddaughter I think I mentioned to you <laughs> have, you seen, have you tried sending the photo over to, to any your family and your I haven't yet because I want, want when you said you might solve the problem but if not I'm going to take what I've got and forward it mm -hmm. uh, and, and because uh, I think I told you to Lel when she was here and she says to me so but grandpa where's your elevator pitch I said to Lel you asked the most important question <laughs> I've been trying for years and uh, I like the way you put it, Bert. Uh, I mean, I, I can see easily to open that up on my phone. Have like a little a link <laughs> I can I, on my phone on the home screen that I had tapped in the right moment, and you know have that in front of me. What comes up for? And, and it comes up with the the face and the animation, you know. And I'm telling the story from from that perspective. But I have that one reference in front of yes. me. Yes. And 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 it's quite. We don't have to talk about reality. We're just working on science fiction mm -hmm. that is, serves the purpose that if they're interested, they can take a look at Panchoff's work on, on uh, the Flatland. And, but uh, all this stuff relates to the physical sciences. No one has done anything related to the problem involved in social science. If a breakthrough as anywhere comparable to the non-common sense and uh, not available to our senses, breakthroughs of relativity and quantum physics. And uh, this is going to be one of the characteristics. This is why I thought it was necessary to list what are the probable characteristics and the problems associated with, with uh, a, prob a breakthrough in social science. And if I can do nothing more than communicate this stuff, if I'm well enough and we can go beyond it, fine. That's all the better. But if we're of one mind and you're comfortable, and this is your pitch, so I just got a good feeling. Let, let's see what happens when we stick to that. To that. That sounds good to me. Yeah. Like, you see, uh, Nadine comes back she, uh, her interest is in interesting, but we, how do we share that? Paul goes his own way, and he's, of course he's very definite in his opinion, but it's not what necessarily what we want. It, it's this thing here, and uh, I, I have a feeling that the closer we can make it tangible, the better off we're going to be. At least it's worth a try. It, as, as far as your... Three or eight. Okay, you've got to go. Oh, I've got to get going. All right, what, when do we meet again? See you again. I'm going to have to bring, get my bag. I'm going to stay. Oh, yeah. 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 When, when, when do we